Hello and good morning. How are you doing today? Hello. How are you? I am good. I am alive. <laughs> Man, I'll tell you, I, I've been waiting to talk with you for the longest time because I've been with you through Arusha. So, I mean, it's like, oh, come on. Yes, I want to talk to her again. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Thank you. You've done something different this time with the spirit glass. I mean, magic and love with a with a solid tribute to someone very special. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a, a story that was a long time coming. And you know, after writing series for so long, I really wanted to write something that was self contained and um, and quiet in comparison. To to re basically remap your writing skills. I mean, what did you have to do on this particular story? You know, what made the spirit glass so different uh, for me was that it required a lot more research. You yeah. know, I, I was raised obviously with a lot of Hindu mythology and a lot of Filipino folklore because my father's from India, my mother's from the Philippines. But what made this story so different, um, and it's interesting, it's what I keep coming back to, is how colonialism vastly treated these two places very differently. Uh, like with the British Raj, a lot of the Hindu Sanskrit epics were well preserved, they were translated. When the Spaniards came and conquered the Philippines and dominated it for 400 years, they stamped out native religions, they decimated languages, they drove out a lot of the priests and spiritual practices in the introduction of Catholicism. And so, the mythology was not nearly as well preserved, and it's the reason I think why what has survived in the Philippines the most when it comes to folklore are its tales of monsters, blood. It's an inheritance of pain, and that was something that was really beautiful and bittersweet to examine when writing the story. You know, but you know, it's really interesting, and what what I love about your writing because it's so honest all the time. I mean, Hinduism versus what what the Filipinos are are studying. I mean, you you bring it together. You bring I mean, and because it's and it shows the reader that oh my God, I I have more than just one thing inside of me as well. Oh, I, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, I mean, the beautiful thing about mythology and folklore is that oftentimes, no matter where we are in the globe, we are all telling the same story over and over again. As as humans, we need reminders of light conquering dark. We need reminders oftentimes of senseless violence, and not because we crave it, but because Sometimes we need to know that, yeah, bad things happen to good people and there's no answer for it. And that's OK. You have to make peace with this unknown. You know, it's the I, I like the way that you, you introduce the Corazon in the, in, in the way that the, there, there needs to be a transfer in, in the life. And the training starts that, you know, it's not just a Babylon. It's not just a word to us. But the, the training is so important. And I think that to a reader that inspires them to say, well, I need training, too, if I want to become something as great as a Babylon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that idea that nothing nothing worth doing comes easily to us. Like, mm -hmm. you know, consider your own story of how you are. You, you are a storyteller. You are recording people's, you know, tales, but also you're able to get answers out of them that maybe they wouldn't necessarily want to part with. That is a skill. That's a magic. It's a craft. And it's one that's honed, I'm sure, over many, many years. And you, you, you love to play with our imaginations in the way of, of bringing up the mystery or the question. What happens if that ghost gets through that spirit glass? And it's like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Corazon has a spirit key, and it's what allows her to see the ghost of her parents every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason why she's so desperate for her powers to mature so that she can hopefully bring them back from the dead. What happens when you're playing with an antagonist, like a big scary ghost, is that even our villains, even the people that we that have hurt us in life, have their own perspective, and we do need to honor that. We need to always be curious about other people's histories, about what's happened to them, how violence perpetuates the violence. And so, for Corazon, not she's not only traveling through the Filipino other world. She's also going on a very deep journey of empathy and compassion mm -hmm. for someone who has hurt her. That's interesting you bring that up because one of the things that I was going to talk about was that, you know, the, the human world versus the spirit world. And a lot of when you're in that spirit world, not everybody can see what's what's going through your mind and how many words are being placed, you know, in action. But yet on the human world, they can see and physically feel it. Yeah. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but you, you do such a great balance of that. What was that like through your writing habit in the way of saying, okay, I can't go too much here. I can't go, you know, less over here. We need to, we need to combine these together. 
Well, you know, I guess I was when it comes to writing, you know, you're you're always it is a delicate act of balancing mm-hmm. what you know and what a reader needs to know. And that's sort of the guiding principle throughout a novel. It's about, you know, not getting so excited about the research that I'm info dumping something, not getting so in the weeds about how the magic works, but I'm making it impenetrable. Because ultimately, when we when we determine what makes a story successful, it comes down to whether or not we were able to make someone feel something. And so the, those were sort of the, I guess, emotional parameters I was thinking about as I was writing. I wish I could figure out a way to, to let you see how my, my wife is a, is a, is a, a tutor. And when, when, when she takes these books and gives them to her young students, they explode with smiles. Do you get to see that action? Oh, oh my God. They react to, oh, you know, they, they really get so excited by your books. Oh, so kind. I appreciate that. They, please, please tell your wife thank you for that. So kind. The, do you know that you're reaching that audience? Because I mean, I mean, as a writer, I mean, you can. I mean, in radio, they train us that. Okay, so your targeted audience is a 25 to 49 year old woman. She's driving this car. Do you have to break it down that much as well? <laughs> no, I mean, I guess in a rather selfish way, I I'm always writing for myself. I'm writing for a younger version of myself, or I'm writing for the 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 version of myself that needed these stories. Um, and writing from a place of delight. So I'm not actively thinking about like a marketing audience or where a book okay. is going to live um, on a shelf. That's, but I sometimes wish I did. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the things that you, you, you put your, your, your thumb on is the maternal love. I just had a conversation with a gentleman. Uh, he didn't really discover a love for life until he was in his 70s. And then he started realizing that he missed a lot because uh, because of his career. He was he was more his storytelling was being at a professional sports game. And, and that's one of the things if, if you don't touch the, the, the young adult reader right now with maternal love, they're not going to know what it is. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, that idea of maternal love, it's its something that's consumed me for a couple of years. And a large part of that was simply because I, my husband and I really struggled to have a family. Mm-hmm. And we dealt with unexplained infertility, the loneliness of that, the deep isolation of, you know, writing for children, wanting to have children, and then being told that you can't. And um, when we, when we, when we finally welcomed our daughter, uh, thanks to IBS and many, many generous and compassionate physicians, I remember that the the feeling that I had most when I held her for the first time, it was love, yes, but most of all it was fear. And I think that that's really what defines parental love. It's the sense that when you hold someone so innocent and precious, there is nothing you wouldn't do for them, nothing that you wouldn't do to protect them from the world or make sure that they never know pain. And yet that's that's not our purpose, right? And so, so much of that is about recon- is about making peace with the unknown, right? Mm-hmm. It's about trying your best. It's about enjoying life, knowing that at any point something terrible could happen, but that doesn't make it any less worth living. Oh my God, I love talking with you. I can't wait to your next book because we're going to get to talk again. Oh yeah, I can't <laughs> wait. It'll be great. <laughs> well, you be brilliant today, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.